right. Uh, we are going to go into PHP land now. All right. And uh, before we do that, um, I think it will. Uh, I think it's important for us to talk about the difference in what we're going to be facing with PHP versus what we just faced with JavaScript. And that doesn't mean that we're all done with JavaScript, by the way. But um, you know, our focus is just going to change. What? <laughs> I have a very bad headache today, and I'm, I'm trying to make the room very dark, as dark as I can, at least around me. So that's why I, sh I shut the interrogation lights off, which are shining in my face. And even on a good day, I don't like those. But um, at any rate, um, fundamental difference between JavaScript and PHP is that PHP is used to create web pages. JavaScript is used to manipulate or change an existing page. Let's draw our famous diagram of a client requesting pages over the internet and interacting with the web server. All right. What we've been studying um, in the first unit of this class in JavaScript was that when the server responds to the client, it gives, in addition to the web page, which contains HTML or XHTML and CSS, we also get JavaScript. And JavaScript are the instructions to manipulate that page that's been created. Um, pick any of the examples that we've done so far in class, the coin example, right? That you made your selections on the form, you press submit, and you change the page. And you change the page without reloading, uh, or, or rather re-requesting from the server a new page. In other words, there's code that gets sent with the initial HTML and CSS that manipulates that page. So if you think, virtually all the examples we've gone fits that mold, where we send the page and we also send code to manipulate that page based on certain user actions, you know, on mouse over, on click, whatever. So key in doing this is the DOM. And the DOM stands for Document Object Model, and it's our way of referencing and manipulating the stuff on that page. All right. JavaScript uses that because JavaScript is run on the browser and is accessing a web page that has been completed. So it can look for something that has an ID of such and such because it has in the browser a web page. And therefore, the DOM allows us to access parts of that web page and do things to that web page. So JavaScript works on a completed web page. And it uses the DOM to refer to elements on, those page, uh, on, on that page so it can change that page. So JavaScript is all about changing a page without requiring um, another request back to the server. All right. When we get into PHP and other server-side scripting technologies, the goal is different, all right? The DOM becomes irrelevant because we're not dealing with a web page that's been completed, all right? We don't have a web page at all. We're in the process of creating a web page that's going to get sent back to the client. If you will, PHP code is a recipe or a set of instructions to create a web page that we're going to send back to the client. It doesn't run in the browser, PHP, it runs on the server. And its output is to produce HTML. So, we have our web server that accesses the PHP scripts. It might access form data. It might access a database. Whatever it does, it does its thing. These instructions tell the server what to do. 
And the output of this is a web page. So the client never sees any PHP code. The client sees the result of the PHP code. That is the HTML and CSS that the PHP code produces. All right? Now, there's an important implication of that, and I guarantee that, you know, at least a half dozen times before the end of the semester, someone in this class, and probably me being one of them, will make the following mistake. And that is of double clicking on a PHP file and trying to open it up in the browser. All right? That's not going to work. Why not? Right, because browsers don't understand PHP. That would be like giving a customer in a restaurant a recipe. All right? The browser understands and knows web pages, knows completed HTML web pages. That's what browsers know. That's what browsers understand. PHP code is not a completed web page. PHP code has to be brought to life, has to be transformed into a completed web page, and that's what the web server does. Therefore, to run any sort of PHP code, all right, we need to run it through a web server, which means that you have to have a web server installed for you to do this. Let me give you an example. I have a little sample PHP script that I've created. And let me find it. If I try to open this up in the browser, I don't get anything. All right? Why not? Because, again, the PHP is code to create a web page. It's not a completed web page. Therefore, a browser doesn't know what to do with it. Now, depending on the specific code, you might see any number of different things, but you're not going to see a completed web page. I was looking before class to see if this computer does have a web server installed on it, and it doesn't seem like it does, which in a way is good, because I'll go through the process of downloading and installing uh, WAMP, WAMP, I guess you'd call it. WAMP is closely associated with LAMP and MAMP, MAMP, all right? These indicate the operating system. So W obviously stands for Windows, L for Linux, M for Macintosh. The other three letters stand for Apache for the web server, MySQL for the database, and PHP for the server-side code. This is effectively the open source, or a big part of the open source solution, a popular open source solution. Um, Open source, uh, I think I've talked about a little bit, maybe, maybe in this class, maybe in other classes, but it's sort of an interesting world where actually people develop and enhance applications uh, mainly on a, voluntary, on a voluntary basis. You know, you could think of open source as being sort of like the Wikipedia of software, just as anyone can contribute to uh, Wikipedia, anyone can go in and view the actual code that makes up the PHP language and make enhancements to it or make bug fixes or whatever. It's one of those things that shouldn't work, but it does. All right? This is in contrast to some other proprietary solutions. By proprietary, I mean you can't go in and edit the .NET framework, for example. You know, that's all proprietary. I couldn't go in and uh, change the way that a ASP.NET text box control worked. I could extend it. I could make my own version of the text box that extended that, but
but I couldn't change the fundamental behavior because I don't have access to the source code. At any rate, oftentimes you'll hear LAMP meaning that it's an all open source shop. In a, uh, so LAMP is sort of a generic term. There is a specific piece of software though that does a lot of the installation of these open source products for you. And that's what WAMP is. And I'm going to go and Google it and install it because I thought that it was installed here, but it doesn't seem to be. So let's go in and install it. Does anyone know why Apache web server is called Apache? It's actually a play on words. Um, Apache is um, not related to the Native American tribe. It's Apache means it has a lot of bug fixes to it. So it has a lot of patches applied to it. So it's Apache web server. All right. If you're on Jeopardy then, yeah, now you know the answer. So let's go and install this. And I'm pretty sure it's straightforward. He, he laughs. Let's try this one. There's all kinds of great anecdotes about um, the way things are named. I'm just going in and accepting the defaults. PHP, for example, is a recursive acronym because the first P in PHD P stands for PHP. So, no. PHP stands for PHP Hypertext Processor or Preprocessor. So at any rate, computer folks are wacky individuals and they come up with funny names for stuff. So we'll let this install. Shouldn't take too long. This is probably the most painless installation um, that I've seen. If you have a Mac, PHP, and Apache should already be installed. You might have to enable PHP though. All right. Okay. Okay, now what we have is we have this software up and running. What I can do is by double clicking on it and starting the server, I'm going to click start all services so that it will start Apache and um, PHP for me. Do I? Let's see. Oh, 
Oh, looky there. I guess I can. <laughs> yeah. At any rate, this tells me my installation worked correctly. You do have to start those services, though, because if you do not start those services, um, then, then it, you know, it, it won't be working uh, correctly. Now, the question is, is, is now we can go and we can, we can run some PHP code and we can see what it looks like. To run PHP code, again, we can't put it just anywhere anymore. Like, for example, on your assignments, um, uh, on your assignments um, with just plain old HTML and JavaScript, you could put your files anywhere. It could be on your thumb drive, the desktop, whatever. You could double click it and you could run it. Um, it's not the case with PHP. It has to be in a place that the web server is going to recognize. So, in this particular case, it's going to put the files, or it's going to want to see the files, in a directory called WAMP www all right so that's where it's going to want to see the files WAMP www so I'm going to go and I'm going to move my little test script inside of there and where did my test script go I moved it in there already, I think. Let's see, is that mine? Yeah, um, yeah, that's mine. I must have had it there to begin with. All right, I want to request that page now, okay? This folder here is considered to be the web server's root, all right? All your files you're going to access based on the path from the web server's root, all right? In this case, the file that I want to run, test.php, is in the web server's root. So all we need to do is put in the name of our server, plus the name of the file. Now, the name of our server, if we know the computer name, we could go and we could put that in. But who wants to, who wants to bother with that? There's a couple of shortcuts we can do. One is we can use the server name localhost. The server name localhost is typically mapped to refer to the web server software that's running on your particular machine. All right. So, and this is this is um, uniform regardless of the kind of web server software you use. So, if you use I I uh, Microsoft's IIS or, or any version. Localhost means this machine's web server software. Alternatively, I could do this as the server name because that is mapped also to mean this machine's web server. But usually in most examples, I'll use localhost. So to access my page, all I need to do is go into my browser, type in localhost, and then type in the path to the file. Well, this file is already in the root, so there is no additional path I need to run. I can simply run test.php, and I get this, which is a long monstrosity that tells me all sorts of information about my PHP installation on this machine. This is, if you run, if you follow the instructions that I have uh, as far as installing the web server in PHP, and you request the page, and this is what you get, you've done it correctly. All right? Um, if not, well, then some part of the process didn't go right, or you, you didn't do something correctly, or whatever. Now, if I put this in a subfolder, for example, then from the root I go to a folder called pages and then I pull up test.php. I would write in the address bar pages slash test.php and I get that. 
So, what have we covered so far? We've covered the fact that PHP is involved in writing web pages. It creates web pages. It doesn't deal with a completed web page, and it doesn't run on the browser. It runs on the web server. Because of that, we have to have a web server installed on our machine to do any development. All right? Because PHP scripts by themselves are simply a recipe for, um, for code, um, for, for a web page. We have to bring that to life. All right? And the one I suggest using is the WAMP server, because that seems to be the, one of the most painless ways to install PHP. Um, and when you do that, you'll get a directory that is your web server's root. In my case, it's WAMP www. Uh, if you take the defaults, that's where it will be for you as well. If you install it a different way, your directory is going to be different than this. All right, just as an FYI. All right. Now, let's take a closer look at what is in a PHP script. Let's start with this very simple PHP script. And I'm going to look at it two ways. I'm going to look at it through my plain old text editor. And I'm going to look at it by doing a view source. And this should sort of give you an idea of how the PHP code in this case, it's pretty simple. However, when we request that page through the web server, the web server takes that simple instruction and translates it into this big blob of HTML, CSS, etc. Okay? Again, this is a PHP script. This is the recipe. This is the meal that was made from the recipe. Okay, this is the web server taking that PHP script, doing its thing, and outputting the results to the browser. We have to request it through a web server to get it. So we have to put it someplace at that, that the web server can find it. And therefore, we found our root directory, and we put it in a subfolder underneath that root directory. Now, this is, a, uh, this is a, just a nice for a little test, but um, we're, you know, we want to do and we want to make our own sort of PHP scripts. All a PHP script is really is a combination of plain old browser stuff, that is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, with certain special PHP tags inserted inside of it. So, I can take any web page that I did as, you know, let's take what I was working on um, with my 216 class. I'm going to rename this guy to be a PHP page. No. All right. And so if I look at this, it, it has, it's just a basic garden variety HTML page. And I can then go and I can request it from the server, and the server will go and will deliver it uh, to me. All right. The server does. The server scans the PHP document, and if what it sees is plain old HTML, all right, it just spits that to the client. No translation involved. If the server, however, sees special PHP tags, it knows that 
is no longer in HTML land, it's in PHP land. And as such, it's going to output the result of that PHP script to the screen. Let's give a, let's give a for instance. For instance, let's say I want to pull the date and put it on this page, the date and time, let's say. Let's go and let's Google. PHP time. Let's take this. I can go and put in my PHP code, I can go in and put a PHP instruction anywhere I want it to appear. So in this case, let's say I want the time to appear right underneath here. So I want the time to go right there. What I have to do is first of all get in the PHP mode. And that's done this way. If we look at the other example we had, we notice that the whole file is in PHP mode. So there is no plain old HTML in this example. Everything was came from the PHP script. But if I go back to this one, I can go into PHP mode and I can say print and what I can do is I can send to the browser with a print statement or an echo statement, either one. I can send it, it really anything I want. So, if I go and do this, all right, I get the date now appearing on the page. All right. Now the specific of the date function isn't important right now. All right. What is important is this. How in my code I have a mix of HTML and CSS stuff and even possibly JavaScript stuff that is static. All right, that doesn't change. I then have pieces of code that sort of fill in blanks of the page with dynamic stuff. All right. So in this case, you know, when you talk about pages being either dynamic, that is changing, or static, all right, that is not changing, most pages really have a little of each, right? Most actual pages on websites have a little bit of, uh, of each. There's some component of it that is static, that really doesn't change. You know, if we look at Amazon, you know, there's a series of links on the top of it. Uh, 
uh, of pages and so on. But then there is a portion of it that is going to change from page to page to page, or it's going to change each time you run it or whatever. And that's exactly what we have here. The stuff that's not in that special PHP tag just gets sent to the browser untouched, unprocessed. However, the stuff that's in the PHP tag first gets processed, then the output from it gets sent to the browser. Now, how do you send output? Well, either the print statement or the echo statement. They do roughly the same thing. I'm not sure if there's any difference between the two of them. We could print some more stuff if we want. This isn't particularly important, but we could do this. I outputted some HTML. Now there really isn't necessarily a point in doing that, right? That could have just as well been static text, right? But I could output um, a tag that included a piece that was dynamic, all right? Let's do that here. Now we won't do that. Now, we can go, if we, without touching this code, if we came back to it on Wednesday and ran it, it would say 10.5 and Thursday 10.6 and so on down the line. So really, what we have is we have plain old HTML that we can interject dynamic content by going into PHP mode and having PHP instructions um, that output something dynamic. Now, outputting the date or outputting the PHP information and all that isn't terribly uh, meaningful, isn't terribly important. Let's do something like make a quiz that we can grade, all right, in PHP. Why would it be a better idea to grade a quiz in PHP than grade it via JavaScript? Yeah, because the user is never going to see the PHP code. Uh, the user could potentially look at the JavaScript and figure out the right answers. Whereas the PHP code, the user doesn't have access to. The user sees the results of the PHP code. So let's go in, and I'm going to copy this guy. And... I'm going to do this in two pages to start out with. My first page is just going to have the form on it. This could just as well be a plain old HTML document because I'm not doing anything tricky or dynamic in this one. I'm just making the uh, form for the user to put the data in. So I'm going to put my form in, or wait a minute, form.
Could I do what? Yeah, I, I will. Give me, give me a second. I want to get the whole thing in before I... All right, translate that form statement. All right, first of all, the two attributes on it are a method and an action. The action refers to the name of the script that's going to process this form. The method refers to how the data is going to get from page one to page two. Your choice of action, I'm sorry, your choice of method is either get or post. All right. Your uh, action will be the whatever name that you have defined uh, for that. Uh, whatever name you're, you're giving for the script that's going to process the input. The one thing I forgot to put in here is a submit button. I'm going to do is I'm simply going to have the script that's going to process this um, display the result that the user typed in. So I'm not going to do any grading of the quiz yet. All right, I'm just going to just display the response that the user types in. So I'll go and I'll save this. I'll save that as quiz two. Now, in order to do that, I can't do this in plain HTML. I can't process the form data in plain HTML, right? Because in HTML, you can only have static stuff. This is going to be dynamic. So even if I'm outputting the value that the user typed in on that form, I have to use PHP code to do that. So I need to go into PHP land. go out of PHP land. And I need to get the value of I need to get the value that has been sent to me. All right? And I'll do it like this. Let's see how well my memory is. All right. I'm not feeling confident today, so I'm going to Google. I think I was right. So let's let's bear with me here and let's follow this process through. All right. I will go and I will request quiz1.php.
Now, quiz1.php simply consists of an HTML form. All right? There was really no PHP on this PHP page, but that's okay, right? PHP can contain any mix of plain old HTML and PHP code and JavaScript and CSS and all that kind of stuff. So the fact that this is really an HTML page, but it has a PHP extension, that's okay. The server just has an easy job with it, right? Um, the server doesn't have to do any translating of the PHP into HTML. It just has the HTML. It just delivers it. All right. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to type in my answer. 1 plus 1 equals maybe. And I'll click grade. All right. Notice what happened when I did that. The URL that it called was quiz2.php. What does that correspond to? That corresponds to the action that was defined in the form. All right. So I'm on the form. I type in an answer. Click the submit button. Again, notice that that's a submit button, not a plain old button. Right. Buttons we use to trigger JavaScript. Submit buttons is what we use to send the form data to the server to be processed. Who's going to process it on the server? Whatever script is given the name uh, in the action attribute. So we click that. We call quiz2.php. And notice what's on the end of this. Let's go and let's pop this in the notepad so that we can take a closer look. localhost, okay, that comes from the server that we were on. Quiz2.php, that was the action, right? Because we had no server associated with it, it assumed we were on the same server, so that's where the localhost comes from. We then have a question mark, all right? The question mark is after the name of the script, and that forms what's called the query string, all right? I mentioned there's two ways to pass data from page one to page two. The way that we're using here is via the query string. And we'll actually see as part of the URL the data that we're passing. So the question mark indicates the beginning of the query string. You know, question, query. All right. The query string consists of, for each form field that has a name and value, we see the name of the form field and the value. We then see an ampersand, the name of the next field, and a value. Let's take a look at our page. Answer equals, the name is used and is made part of the query string. Now, Here's one thing that it might be tough for you to get used to, all right? After six weeks of preaching get element by ID, get element by ID, it's the name that gets passed in the server-side script, not the ID, all right? So if we had an ID on there, it really wouldn't do us any good. Truth be told, when I'm dealing with form fields, I usually give them a name and an ID and make them the same just for simplicity. All right, that, that just makes it a little easier to, to figure out. But if this had an ID and not a name, then this wouldn't work. So the name corresponds to the first attribute that we're passing on the query string. The yes corresponds to the actual value of that query string. All right, that's what I typed in, yes. The other form thing that I have is I have a submit button called btn submit, btn submit equals grade, equals grade. So whatever button I press, I could potentially have more than one button on a page, right? I could have change this record or delete this record. It will know which button got pressed based on the name of the button and the value. So you can use that to determine what got submitted. So, this query string we can determine just looking at this. 
The query string is going to be whatever server I'm on, which is localhost, slash quiz2.php, question mark, answer equals whatever the value of the, the text box was, ampersand, btn submit equals grade. All right? So that's how the data gets from page one to page two. When we get into server-side scripting, this is a big deal, how you get data from here to there, right? Every request to a web server is sort of a standalone request. They call that uh, a stateless protocol. There, <clears throat> excuse me. Therefore, we have, to make, we have to take some steps to make sure that we can pass data from here to there. All right? And one way to do it is via the query string. <coughs> so, that took us into calling this page with those values on the query string. Now let's look closer at the script that processed it. And if we look at that script, we'll see HTML, HTML, HTML. Okay, here is PHP land. All right. Now, dollar sign name equals dollar sign get answer. What this says is give me the value of the thing on the query string that has a name of answer, right? <coughs> Which, what's the value of the thing on the query string that has the name of answer? In this case, it's yes. It's going to store that in a variable called dollar sign name. <coughs> in PHP, all variable names start with a dollar sign. Dollar sign name is a value, is a name, or is a variable name that I made up. Dollar sign underscore get is a built-in function for PHP. You can sort of tell that at a glance because it starts with an underscore and it has a capital, you know, it's, it's written capitalized. That's sort of a good way to tell all the built-in functions are, or all the built-in objects, rather, are, are like that. All right, so it's easier to tell. What am I doing then? I'm printing out the value of that name variable. Now, in PHP, PHP is also a weakly typed language. In fact, there's no way to declare variables in PHP. You simply start using them. All right? And I'm just saying here, print name and it will output the value of that name variable. One thing about PHP with comparison to JavaScript, it also is case sensitive. So if I were to, to, to say print capital N-A-M-E, it wouldn't know that variable. All right? It only knows name with, an un, with a lowercase n. The other thing is where well, JavaScript is sometimes forgiving if you, have, uh, if you don't end your line with a semicolon, PHP is not forgiving, all right? That's a, a mistake I make all the time, is I'll go in and leave that off, in which case... you get something like that. The error messages that you get won't be terribly descriptive, Essentially, where it says unexpected, it means that it was expecting something else. All right. And if we look close at the line of code, we can see, oh, it must have been expecting a semicolon at the end of this line. So now, we're not grading our quiz yet, right? We're just taking whatever input the user types in and outputs it. We're not saying the value of that. Our next step, which we'll save to Wednesday, will be to take and output um, whether they got the question right or not. All right, we'll go in and we'll actually look at their answer and see was their answer correct or was their answer not correct. And that'll be our next step with this. I'm going to zip up because the way this works, I'm just going to zip up uh, 
the entire www folder um, and, and post that to Angel as uh, today's example. It's probably an easier way to do it. All right. Any questions about any of this? My suggestion would be, number one, make sure that you've installed PHP on your machine. Um, we probably should look in lab, those of you going to lab today, to see if it's installed and how it's installed. All right. If not, we'll have to get on the lab folks to make sure that that happens. All right. But if you want to work on your machine at home, make sure you have PHP installed. And then try playing around with simply passing data from one page to another. Really, that's all your first lab is. You're doing a Mad Lib where you're supplying uh, some blanks. The user fills them in, clicks submit, and then it puts the values of that uh, into some text. All right. We'll see you over in lab.